I think this speaks to the power of a true global macro mind. And there are two things to consider. When I say global macro, people generally think U.S. equities, U.S. rates, credits, maybe European equities, credits, and you know commodities effects, and that's it. The reality is there is a lot more. Investors need to become more acquainted with looking at the world, and the world isn't the U.S. and Europe only. It's everything else. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to another edition of our Global Macro Series, where today, as usual, I'm joined by my co-host, Jim Kassan, as well as a returning guest to the show, namely Alfonso Pecacello, whom we spoke to last about a year ago. Welcome back, Alfonso, and thank you so much for joining Jim and I today for what promises to be a lively and unpredictable conversation as part of our Global Macro Series. How are you doing? Is spring, has that arrived in the Netherlands? Well, unfortunately for me, it's my turn to be in the Netherlands, where it's going to be three Celsius degrees tomorrow. So the answer is no. Very nice to see you guys. Uh, I am a regular listener of Top Traders Unplugged. Super good podcast. So super happy to be on the seat. Let's see if I can keep up with the level. Oh, I'm sure you can. And Jim, how are things with you? Um, what about summer? Is that where you find spring, in the Windy City? Spring has sprung. Uh, the spring here is about a month and a half, and, and we're like we're entering it now. It'll be summer soon. But uh, yeah, no, things are good right now. Fair enough. All right. Okay. Now, I would like to kick off, you know, like we did last year, just to hear your current big picture macro framework, Alf, um, and just to see kind of what you're thinking today, what may have changed from last time. And, you know, if you can't remember when we last spoke, I can summarize it very easily for you because you were pretty bearish on everything. Bonds via BTPs, stocks, credit spreads. I'm sure a few things has changed since then. So um, I'll let you do that and then we'll dive into uh, some specifics. Okay, so I think that the Fed will cut interest rates to zero to one percent in 2024 it's probably my most controversial take and that will be the result of the massive tightening in monetary and fiscal policy that we have gone through in 2022 and 2023 the tightening we will keep applying through a much tighter fiscal policy um, ahead of the elections for sure and then um, a tighter for longer fed funds above equilibrium until something effectively breaks. When you have that combined tight monetary policy, monetary policy and fiscal policy stance for a while, you're basically waiting for an accident to happen. And the Silicon Valley Bank or First Republic Bank now episodes are not in that camp. Those are idiosyncratic liquidity, poor risk management banking issues. So we haven't gotten to that stage yet, but we will. And when we get there, I don't think the Federal Reserve will have the chance to accommodate with 100 or 200 basis point cuts. As in every recession and in every credit deleveraging episode, the Fed will need to cut way below neutral levels, which means 0 to 1% Fed funds. Great. Good stuff. Jim, do you want to dive in first and then we'll see where we go? Yeah, um, I'd love to start it. You know, I've, I've read a bunch of your stuff, and and obviously we've talked several times, Alfonso. I, I think very highly of your work. I, it doesn't mean I agree with all of it, but that doesn't mean uh, you know I don't I don't uh, at least dive quite deep. And I, and a lot of it is a masterclass on cyclical effects of credit, you know, on economies, uh, how cycles come and go. 
my view uh, is that, yes, I, I agree with a lot of the cyclical effects that you're talking about, the lags that they operate under and, and what we're seeing in real time. My uh, disagreements tend to focus on their, their lack of kind of looking at it outside of what's the last 30, 40 year, uh, where it was a very two-dimensional cyclical world, right? Um, it's the secular effects that I, that I most worry about. Um, and, and you've heard me talk about this before, but I'd love to kind of start and go back to the last time we saw inflation, 1968 to 1982, um, and, and really ask you how you believe this if, whether or not this time is similar or different than that time. And then uh, t we'll, we'll take it from there. I, I'd love to kind of walk through and understand how you think about where we might be secularly, not just cyclically. Yeah, excellent way to steer the conversation. So uh, the economies of the 70s was materially different than today, highly industrialized. Um, wage growth was a big driver of nominal spending. That was also because the share of labor, um, as, as let's say the share of importance as one of the factor for total economic growth was much larger than capital. So labor was beating capital in terms of scarcity, in terms of effect on economic growth. It was a highly industrial labor intensive economies, the one of the seventies, but also unions had a lot of power. That is something that is materially different. Once from today, one statistics is that to generate the same million dollar of sales, a US company today needs about one tenth of the employees in it in the seventies. So employees were important. You know, wage was wage growth was an important driver of nominal spending. Now that's the first difference. The second was obviously uh, related to this one, which is demographics. We were coming after the second world war with the, you know, the, the post second world war demographic boom. We had all these guys turning 20, 30, joining the labor force. So labor force growth was pretty solid, actually. We had labor force growth and productivity growth, which combined together were roughly in the 3.5% area. That means, Jem and Niels, that the U.S. could grow structurally 3.5% per annum without the use of any leverage, nothing. Which means total debt level in the economy were much lower. There was no need to lever up and push economic growth through the use of leverage because structural growth was so strong. And it was also an economy which was highly industrialized and dependent on labor. So this is where we started, right? And we had inflationary episodes during that era that were much harder to fight, Jem. And I think that's where you want to go because they were so rooted and so easy to corroborate by these structural factors. When you have an inflationary episode and you have labor being such an important driver of nominal spending, it's easy to see how an inflationary episode brings people to ask for higher wage growth and how you can cause a wage price spiral because there is scarcity, let's say, of labor and, high, and an economy which is highly dependent on that labor and on that wage growth. So you have these wage price spirals that happened in the 70s and the economy was structurally different than it is today. Back forward to today, you have, of course, a much more um, capital intensive economy, let's say. So where capital beats labor, where demographics is what it is, where you had the Chinese workforce and Asian workforce expanding rapidly, providing cheap labor to a globalized economy. This will change over the next 20 years with the Chinese workforce shrinking by 30% over the next 30 years. That's quite something. You're not going to have that cheap supply of labor back again, but for the next five years, you're probably still going to look at, a, at an economy which is very, you know, not so much uh, driven by labor, where capital still dwarfs labor, where technology plays a large role, where demographics is what it is, at least for the next three to five years. Those are the major differences I see between the 70s and today. Like I said, a masterclass. I love it. So let's push back on, on three of those, those three of those ideas. I agree uh, about the 1970s, uh, particularly if you start looking at the late 1970s, that that's kind of where things were. The problem is, is the, we are not really in 68 as much as we are in 65, 
right? In my opinion, we are early on in this cycle and it's different. Obviously it's always, it's a, it's always a bit different. Um, but we are in a position where, um, where deglobalization is moving forward and it, and it, it's a, for this, a lot of the same reasons that we saw in 1965, right? Uh, when Kennedy was assassinated, his view of this, uh, this great society program of fiscal spending became reality very quickly under LBJ. There was bipartisan support here in the United States and we had a fiscal wave, right? Nothing compared to the fiscal wave we've had now. That really kicked off um, this inflationary push. This, as inflation went higher, we began to see resource scarcity. There was a lot of protectionism at the time, similar to what we're beginning to see now, um, which led to the beginning of a Cold War, eventually, the beginning of a hot war in Vietnam, right? And a very, very um, kind of similar set of effects that we're seeing now. Resource scarcity, deglobalization, ultimately constrain the availability of labor, whether we are an industrialized uh, economy or not, we can argue, but constraining labor supply to the borders of a country dramatically, I think we can all agree, increases um, inflation. Those are the, the, the key similarities. I would take, uh, you know, here in the US and even in Europe, uh, services 70 uh, 5% of the economy. It's still very labor intensive. Um, I don't think this argument of industrial versus non-industrial is as relevant. And part of the reason we become here uh, so uh, untied to the effects of labor is because, as you mentioned, we've been able to export it to China. Um, and, uh, and that's not, in my opinion, going to be happening as much going forward for several reasons. Um, so labor importance, I think, is, and, and there's lots of metrics I can point to, is significantly on the rise in the last five to 10 years. Uh, demographics, let's talk about demographics. I agree, demographics is destiny. Millennial generation is, is the biggest uh, kind of demographic bubble since the baby boomers. And right as baby boomers are falling off and, and they have not been the core you know, source of demand because they've been out past their family generating years, we are now getting a millennial generation that is at 40% of the wealth creation and importantly, household formation that baby boomers were at this part of the generation. So you have a millennial bubble, which is at 40% of the, the, the household creation that is now entering those years and is demanding, right, across the world, not just in the United States, globally, help in building those households. And guess what? That's politics. If there's something that, if you wanna, if you wanna get people who are trying to create a family and who have kids to vote, there, there's only one solution, right? Is to help them in their pocketbooks. And that's what has shocked people in the last year, despite that huge fiscal wave two years ago, three years ago, that we've continued to see significant fiscal moves. And to your 2024 um, argument uh, of, of zero rates, what do you think happens if we do get an economic pullback into what is a 2024 election season here in the United States? You better believe we get more fiscal. So this is, again, just to be polemical, I'm gonna, uh, sure. I'd love to kind of hear your, your kind of, uh, kind of retorts and thoughts. Otherwise, I do believe we're in a very similar, maybe we can find common ground too. I find uh, we are on a very similar trajectory in the sense that fiscal uh, global uh, strife, you know, beginning of a, you, what you could argue is a cold war, uh, hot war, and then resource scarcity entities like OPEC and what now are now trying to flex their muscles whether it's via currency battles, whether it's via uh, you know resource battles, economic battle battles, we're seeing that across the board. And again, that is uh, those things rhyme uh, with the last time we had inflation. So, Jem, when it comes to being polemic, we're both market people. Uh, so there is no market unless two people disagree on what should be the price, right, to trade something. So, same with opinions. Let's say uh, I have no problem with that. I'm happy to hear another side of, of the story. Actually, I don't think that we are that much far away. So I, what, what I always hear from my clients as well is that there tends to be a confusion in macro between cycles and trends. So we are now debating in the last part of the conversation, what will be the inflation trend or long-term average over the next 10 to 20 years, right? Is it going to be 
the one and a half percent that we saw in the last 20 years, or is it going to be three or four percent? And that's a macro trend, right? I, I don't know where your vote is. Actually, let me answer that question. I think the probability that inflation will turn to be higher structurally over the next 20 years is not negligible at all. It's not so that the tail of the distribution has to be fatter on the right end than it was 10 years ago. And exactly for the reasons you're mentioning, I would add a couple of them. I mean, the global supply chain has proved to be not particularly uh, resilient to all sorts of problems. And many businesses, including Germany, Germany Inc. as a country, basically has made sure that the on-time global supply chain was one of the main features that was underpinning their economic growth. And when you realize that it can get broken, you need to make, to do something about it. It could be onshoring. Now, I don't expect all you know, German car manufacturing jobs to be onshored back in Germany, but even on a marginal basis, if you want to find labor within your own um, yeah, well, boundaries of a country, you have to pay up, right? So that makes sense. Uh, so that component of wage growth will be something relevant to observe. The availability of cheap labor elsewhere will be shrinking, as we discussed. And there are more reasons why to believe inflation might actually be higher on average than it was over the last 20 years. What I always tell to my clients is it's going to take five or 10 years for that to play out. It's a long-term trend, which means the distribution will be probably moving a bit to the right, but you're talking five years, 10 years, decades, right? Cycles are a different thing because people tend to confuse Maybe they have a strong view that inflation will turn to be higher over the next decade. That doesn't mean inflation can't be 0% in 2024. In the cycle, temporarily speaking, that can still happen, even if the, your long-term average moves up to 4%. So one thing is, a, is an inflation cycle, the other is an inflation trend. And on an inflation trend, I think we agree more than you think uh, overall. On the cycle itself, um, I do believe that as in any recession over the last 100 years, if you are to get one, especially a recession that involves some deleveraging in some corners of the credit market, any of these recessionary episodes over the last 100 years have brought inflation down by, on average, 6.8 percentage points since the peak. That's quite a lot in 16 months on average. And every recession has managed to bring down inflation. There has been no not disinflationary recession episodes over the last 100 years. And there are good reasons why a recession is disinflationary in the first place. So when it comes to the cycle, I think we're, we have tightened fiscal and monetary a lot for a long period of time. We'll keep doing that because the mandate of the Fed is to do that until they actually see core inflation trending down to 2%. They'll probably be a bit too late. The moment you are there, core inflation doesn't stop at two or 3% annualized, but it probably moves down because of a deleveraging episode. Yeah, so uh, I think you're right. I think we do tend to agree more on the distribution. I like that you're talking about a distributions of, uh, of potential outcomes longer term. I would differentiate my view in that I, I don't see secular uh, inflation going to two, 3% or three, I see it going to 5% plus, maybe seven, 8%. I would also differentiate our cyclical view in that I agree. I mean, we're clearly going into some type of cyclical uh, downturn. The, the, the effects of monetary policy have a direct effect, uh, as does fiscal, right, on, on that cyclical story. But it is, I think, a much stickier uh, demand equation, much like we saw in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, I think we're more likely to see a dramatic earnings recession in the next four, five years than we are to see a actual deep recession because we are in a very demand push economy. And I think very much people lose sight of that difference. We are still at record or close to record price to sales, record uh, profit margins. Uh, these are assumed to be structural realities um, by most people, that we live in a new technological age where profits are structurally higher. I take a great exception to that fact. Um, I think they are a structural effect of historically low interest rates and the globalization that that causes. 
the, uh, the profit seeking and growth uh, investment that that causes, and ultimately the technological innovation that that drives. When those things start going in reverse and labor costs increase, and we're dealt with uh, a, a world that uh, there is a limited sphere to which to expand in the economic realities set back in. Um, and, uh, and I do believe we're gonna have dramatic margin um, compression in the next five to 10 years. So um, I, I would argue that in 68 to 82, we did get three recessions, three. That's a lot in 12, 14 years. The reality is that short-term Fed funds did come down in each one significantly. 10% uh, down to, I'm looking at the numbers now, down to, back down to, to three and a half, sorry, uh, that 10% down to three and a half in the first one. Uh, and the second recession, 14 down to 6%. And the last one, 20 down to 10%. But growth, GDP growth, not just nominally, in real terms, throughout that 14 year period was above trend in real terms, again, with very hot inflation, much higher than it has been in the last 20 years. And I think that's the big important takeaway. Demand will continue to be sticky. Structural inflation will continue to work higher. And even if we have cyclical downturns, like I believe we agree we're going into, I believe they will be much shallower than people expect. And the effects uh, will be felt, felt on short-term interest rates. But I will actually argue, and this is where we, where we connect the top traders unplugged, the trade will ultimately be to bet on the secular increase of interest rates and that the longer end of the curve will continue to remain sticky into recessions and will actually work its way higher. So when it comes to the long end of the bond market, Jem, I want to stress out a couple of things. So the curve uh, has inverted in overnight index swaps curve for the first time in March 2022. So it's been over a year that 530 is in OIS, not in the treasury, but in OIS. So merely reflecting the term structure of Fed funds, that curve has inverted already for more than a year as we speak, which basically was, you can basically call it a protest, I should say, from long-term bond investors saying, you know, guys, if you hike above whatever we deem to be equilibrium, Jam, let's say a 3%, if you hike above that, we'll assume that the damage you do to long-term inflation and growth is quite something. So we'll make sure that once we are past the five and 10 year term structure for Fed funds, we'll price in some weaker growth, weaker inflation, some long-term damage because of the short-term tightening cycle. This has been quite, uh, it's basically been a relentless feature of the bond market for the last 13 months. Now, if you believe that inflation is something structural that is going to reprice to 4 or 5%, there are a million macro trades out there where you can try and make money out of it. So the term premium in the bond market is basically non-existent, not at all. So there is basically investors don't want to be compensated to take duration risk rather than just roll their T-bills at 5%. They could just decide to do that. And instead, they are happy to buy 30-year bonds or receive 30-year OIS swaps, 100 basis point through, um, where Fed funds will be basically at least for the next three to four to six months. So there is no required compensation from long-end investors. If you look at optionality, which is something you look at pretty often, I'm, I'm sure, can we talk for a second about bond volatility? Because it's been quite an interesting phenomenon. Absolutely. And Many of my um, hedge fund clients, when the higher for longer narrative was prevalent in February, they were basically looking for ways to fund their trades, as every hedge fund manager does, right? Not to pay carry on the trades too much. One of the ways to fund these trades was to sell calls on gold, on bonds, the idea was on bond prices. The idea was the Fed is just not going to cut. You know, the hurdle to cut rates is so high, I can just sell that optionality away, use the premium and fund my trades, right? Then the banking crisis happened. And at that moment, you're basically caught completely off guard, both because you sold vol and also you're on the wrong side of the delta. So you're, you're wrong in two cases. You sold optionality the wrong way. So you have to cover it up, right? And basically a couple of hedge funds blew up as well, as we saw it reported effectively in the results. 
by selling optionality and being you know forced to to cover it what that also caused was that front end bond market vol remained extremely high a seen in three months five years of options like three months two years of option vol was i don't know like 170 basis point annualized i mean i can't make the square root uh, on top of my head to calculate what the daily move is but it's a gigantic number like you have to have 10 basis point daily move in two years treasuries i think to get a break even just ridiculous and look bond market volatility is really important for overall risk taking because fixed income is such a large and systemically important part of all institutional portfolios that when it ends up bringing more ball to your overall portfolio volatility you just don't have any budget to add anything else right it loses all its properties of diversification and low vol and stable income all of that is lost temporarily when it comes in as well when it reduces itself and it normalizes back then generally all you know niels is looking at me there all the ctas and all the systematic investors generally get some renewed budget to get back in into their their trades but long and bond vol the reason why i'm making all this story is that even during the um, you know the hysterical moments of the banking crisis in march vol on long dated bonds didn't really explode at all so that's another signal from investors that they, you know, we can talk about the cycle in interest rates, the cycle in inflation, but there is literally almost nothing priced and no term premium, no risk premium, no optionality premium, nothing is priced in for structural inflation at the moment. So, Jem, I'm saying if you are really believing in your, in your thesis, there is so much out there to trade. So I think you'd agree a year and a half ago when this, uh, or a year and so ago, when this first decline uh, began and the move in interest rates uh, began, there was a, a well-held understanding that inflation was transitory. And markets very much were pricing that inflation was transitory. The vol across the board and bonds and FX and Dixie and across the board, right? We're incredibly low. Yet, we saw a significant move both in vol and in long end of the curve and had incredibly profitable trades despite how the market was priced. So I wanna be careful uh, looking at the bond market and saying, hey, the bond market's always right. If, it's, if the trade's there, then, then it must not be real. Now. You are very much right that there are structural flexive effects, as we both know, that are critically important to the way things move based on how markets are priced, right? But that does not mean the secular realities don't exist. And actually, the greatest opportunities are when you can find, and they happen, and they have happened the last several years, and I believe they will continue to happen. It's about riding the wave of the cyclical effects and the positioning effects versus that secular reality that's going to make you very wealthy. That's what made people wealthy in the last 30 years is driving that secular trend. If you had that secular trend in interest rates, that simple trend, right? And all the things that meant for equity multiples, for growth versus value, you go across the board, you are inordinately wealthy. So if you understand the secular trend, if you can pick to it and have conviction in it, and don't get lost in the cyclical trends. Use them as opportunities when narrative changes, when people turn to that deflationary argument or whatnot. That is what will ultimately lead to great success in these markets. I think people get too caught in the cyclical and miss out in the big picture. Yes, I took the other stance before saying people confuse cycles and trends. The other approach is to not get lost in the weed of cycles and focus on structural trends. Obviously, it's about trying to find trades with a positive expected value over time and you know find good risk reward. Talking about that, I think Europe deserves a couple of words too uh, from my end. I mean, given my Italian accent, people maybe might want to know something about Europe from me. Absolutely. So look, um, I am watching this banking situation unfold and 
I think people confused a liquidity crisis with a credit crisis, and the liquidity crisis can be fixed by central banks. They have tools to make sure that the value of the collateral, in this case, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, effectively is backstopped at 100 cents on the dollar. And that's what they did. So walking back for a second, regulation in 2013, uh, Basel III, um, high quality liquid assets, uh, liquidity coverage ratio, all these things I was subject to myself as well when trading for a bank, these effectively meant that banks could buy treasuries and the regulators would consider treasuries and government bonds exactly the same as cash, or I should say the same as reserves at the central bank. So there would be no liquidity haircut. Treasuries, government bonds have are level one HQLA assets. They have no liquidity haircut. They are the same as reserves for the liquidity coverage ratio calculation. And they have no capital requirements, nothing. So if you buy treasuries, you don't need to attach any capital at all to your purchase. Basically, it means regulators consider government bonds the same as reserves at the central bank. Now, guess what? When it's government bonds and the value of these treasuries and this collateral, the very reason why the banking system should experience a systemic crisis, I'm sorry, but they will not make this happen. It is paramount important to make sure that the value of this collateral remains pristine. And they did so basically with the BTFP and the other tools that they came up with. The fears also spread to Europe at that point, right? And in Europe, we do a lot of things suboptimally, but on regulation, we're much tighter than the US. Uh, I've been uh, buried under regulation myself for years, working for a European bank. Um, there is a thing in Europe, which is the um, called the supervisory outlier test on interest rate risk. So European banks are subject to a stress test that tr stresses all their assets and liabilities, not only held to maturity bonds, but people are obsessing about that, which represents 5% of the balance sheet of a bank, roughly. You look at the entire interest rate risk on assets and liabilities and the hedging derivatives as well of a bank, and the ECB forces European banks to stress test this net risk that they run, right? So I had a look at it and the ECB says, okay, move up the interest rate by 200 basis point and flatten the curve. So the most negative possible scenario for a bank, how much is your capital gonna draw down because of that? The median European bank takes a capital drawdown of 6%. I mean, on the entire capital base, the entire capital base goes down by 6% which means the core tier one ratio goes down by what? 60, 70 basis points. Is that a hit? Yes. Does that mean the bank goes belly up? No, not nearly. And why? Because the stress test exists and so banks have done their homework and they've hedged their interest rate exposure as they would normally do. In the US, there is no supervisory outlier test. There is nothing like that, which meant even a large bank in principle could act like a cowboy when it comes to interest rate risks on their balance sheet. But if you look deeper, JP Morgan willingly publishes the result of this potential test and they would get the 5% capital drawdown. So again, people I think have overemphasized the nature of this risk, but European banks are instead more exposed to commercial real estate on the margin and to real estate in general than US banks are. Why? In Europe, people have forgotten already, but we have got negative interest rates for something like six to seven years and negative real rates for almost 10 years in Europe. So if you were a European bank or a pension fund or an asset manager, dude, you had to find a way to make returns. Laws in Europe made sure you couldn't pass through negative interest rates to your customers for years and years on end. So the only way to maintain your net interest margin was to generate returns on your assets. So you ended up doing that by taking risk in securities and in sectors which delivered some returns. And the real estate market, because of leveraged securities, could deliver some of these returns. And so the exposure which sits in commercial real estate, in leveraged real estate securities on the European banking balance sheets is actually pretty large. And European commercial real estate prices are already experiencing severe drawdowns because of structural problems with the office space and the vacancies and all of that. So that is a credit problem. If it unfolds further, 
that's a credit problem. The ECB can't do anything to backstop the value of the collateral, can't bid up a, a vacant office in Germany to make sure that the value of the collateral for a German bank remains good. It can't do that. So I think that is where people should focus their attention more if they're looking for banking stress, particularly in Europe, rather than uh, a liquidity crisis. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful points. I, I'm i actually, this is something we agree on, you know, I do think the uh, the banking problems that we have recently seen are are grossly overdone. Um, there is always a tail on banks. It's structurally how banks are are, are built. Uh, the leverage within banks defines that that if there is a run uh, on the bank, that there will be a problem. But that simple fact does not mean we have a banking problem, and it is one that is well understood. Uh, that that regulation, as you mentioned, globally, uh, domestically as well, have come dramatically uh, since 2008 um, to prepare for. And so I, I do think the focus there has been over-exaggerated. That said, I do think what we saw is, you know, a canary in the coal mine in the sense that there is a lag to interest, you know, monetary policy and interest rates going from zero to five, a significant one. You can argue nine months. You could argue 18 months uh, based on, on how you look at it. And that is because, you know, I've mentioned this before, there's 450 trillion assets, 350 of those are not, you know, equities. And most of those re-rate very slowly. On top of that, even equities, uh, buybacks drive a major uh, source of demand in equities. And there is a significant, uh, you know, lag there. We are in Q1 saw still close to record buybacks for equities, despite, you know, in the last year before that, uh, a 5% increase, you look forward Q2, Q3, Q4, it's a cliff, right? You start to see a dramatic fall off. So what the banking runs tell us, you know, as again, it's about that unknown risks underneath the hood, right? Of these effects and how they build up until kind of that Minsky moment, right? And so there are signs now that little pockets of sand are, are collapsing, right? under what is a hollow, hollowing internal uh, mountain of sand. Um, and I think uh, we've yet to reach that kind of grain of sand where things really kind of collapse, but but that is a clue of what is out there. And I think that's really how we should be looking at it, not uh, not as the core driver of, of what's happening here. Uh, but so we do definitely agree uh, on that regard. Yeah. I... Uh... Just, I was just looking at the risk reward of the stock market as well in different sectors recently. And we have gotten to a point where uh, people were very happy to bid for downside in banks um, to a point where puts were pretty expensive over the last two to three years in a percentile ranking. But that has faded away, I think, over the, uh, the last few weeks because I think you tweeted it out or you said it in an interview as well. When nothing happens and people are pricing a lot to happen, then naturally you need to unwind these trades where you spend a lot of insurance premium to protect you against nothing because nothing is happening. Then you unwind the trades and people get sucked in basically to reallocate or to re-leverage back up, right? And that's what we have seen, I should say. Absolutely. It's true for equities as well. It's across the board, right? The event vol that, that eventually creeps into markets is fuel. Right, uh, and if you get a narrative where you also have shorter positioning uh, on top of that, it can be a pretty powerful combination. But that's why often you get first moves, and then you know it's the second move that gets you, uh, which is what we should be looking for at this point. So then I look at where we stand today, and if you just try to standardize measures of. Um, downside protection in the S and P 500. Okay, so let me let me say one takes a 25 delta put on the S and P 500 with a three month expiry. Okay, so let's say right now that would mean roughly a seven to ten percent decline for people to understand in terms of moneyness. Three to six months out, it's priced basically at the 90th percentile in terms of cheapness over the last two to three years. It is relatively cheap to try and buy some uh, downside optionality. Now, the problem is that even last year, we haven't seen any jump risk. We haven't seen anything that makes you materialize um, that kind of expression, right? So people are, I think, a bit 
not in love anymore with put options. It has been pretty expensive as a way to express a theme which was correct, which was this low grind down in equity markets, right? So uh, people might debate, well, you know, if we move from 4,100 and there is some serious credit stress, banking stress, a recession, anything of that sort, and we move back to 36, 3,700, but we move there without jump risk, then are you sure that buying put options is the right way to express the trade? And I think that's been a debate that has resurfaced recently because in the past we were used to the opposite. We were used to nothing happening. And when you had, an, a, a, let's say, a drawdown in equities, it came with a jump. It came with it, right? People were busy selling ball the whole time. And when, you know, the rare episodes where the stock market actually, actually had a drawdown, put options could work. Last year, the stock market was in a drawdown the entire year long. And actually, I think that riding, sorry, sorry, buying puts for the entire year and rolling them over lost money. But correct me if I'm wrong in 2022. You are absolutely right um, about the effects and what's happening. Now, this is my bread and butter, right? So this, this is another opportunity to talk about cyclical versus secular effects now in a different way, not in terms of equity markets, but in terms of vol. If I were to give you a history of the last eight years in the last minute in vol world, it would be as follows. August 2015, yuan devaluation, vol explodes relative to the equity market move. You have a, a, a 5x vol reaction relative to, to normal. Mark, uh, vol markets go dark. Vol, anybody who's short vol gets blown out. Anybody who's long it makes an incredible killing. Everybody piles into vol. Short sellers are gone. Six months later, you get Fed 2016, oil goes to 20, and credit, high yield starts to blow out. The world uh, grabs what's a really cheap vol, assuming that vol will perform again, and vol gets decimated into that decline. Everybody who owns vol is like, why, why would you ever own vol uh, if it's not going to perform into the biggest decline since 2008, which is what that was, 12% decline bigger than the yuan devaluation decline of 9%. So people start losing faith and stop investing in puts and uh, start selling puts and put sellers make a lot of money for about a year and a half, two years. 2017, vol collapses. Everybody leaves the vol space reflexively. The vol selling leads to the lowest implied and realized vol in history, in 125 years of history, which leads to the Volpocalypse, massive vol event, right? And you're starting to see this sign curve in action, right? 18, uh, you know, everybody who's short vol blows out. Everybody who's long vol made a killing. Everybody piles into vol. October to December, 2018, we get the biggest now decline, right? Again, since 2008, vol gets decimated into that decline. Step, 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 three and a half months of absolute vol decimation. What, what pursues? Everybody proceeds. Everybody slowly moves out of the vol space, says, why would you ever own vol if vol doesn't work into a decline? Enter March 2020, a year and a half later, vol explosion, market explosion, and reflexively kind of one of the biggest vol events we've had. So what does everybody expect? Well, better own vol. So 2020 comes along. Two years later, right on clockwork. And what doesn't work? When we're at record skew, record vol hedging, people see that train coming. It's going to work. We're ready. We're all lined up. Decimation. So we're, tell me, where are we in this cycle, right? It's not like, it, it, it's not uh, confusing to me, you know, where, where we are cyclically. We have had a complete abandonment of vol hedges because it hasn't worked. Uh, and, and we're at a point where the secular risks are still there. Right. And as I mentioned, the best opportunities is when the secular opportunity is there, but the positioning and the cyclical realities start to line up. So I would caution people to say, oh, look at what happened the last year and a half. Why would you own puts? I don't know. Will it work out? Look at the positioning. Look at what's happening underneath the hood. Um, and, and you very much had a complete loss of conviction. And by the way, this zero DTE business, everybody's talking about it, but nobody really expresses, everybody talking about that massive increase in zero DTE trade. Nobody's talking about that 
there's been a dramatic increase and equally as large decrease in actually 30-day vol trading. Volume hasn't gone up on, on total. It's just shifted to zero DTs because Vega has not worked. Optionality has not worked. What's worked is just realized move if you're kind of playing direction with it and using it for convexity. So people have replaced real vol with kind of short-term bets to cover themselves. They're band-aids, they work for a day, but what they don't do is expose you to, to a secular move and a structural move that can really hedge you in a time of structural weakness. So anyway, I'll get off my soap soapbox, but that's, that's the history. That's the cyclical realities of where we are. Um, now we could go into arguments about secular, even further secular, what does inflation mean for uh, mm -hmm. downside vol? And what does it mean for hedging? Um, generally poor actually for equities, very good for FX, interest rates, dollars, gold, a lot of these things that, again, you look at, um, there are secular opportunities involved there. Um, so we're actually at a very interesting time, if you believe in that inflationary thesis, as you mentioned, to particularly bet on uh, cross-asset uh, vol, because uh, they are all not connected as much as they will, will have they were in the last 30 years um, in many ways when you're in inflation. But I'll, I'll, I'll cede the floor to our, our, our guest um, but yeah, I, I, the vol, the vol story is, is so important. And last point, seventies, eight, you know, in the sixties and seventies, we didn't have options. We didn't have vol. So we are in a unique situation. We are really going into an inflationary environment with a whole host of new products that didn't exist back then, um, which, you know, equals a very kind of potentially dangerous, but also, you know, no data to tell us what exactly should happen. Well, I knew I would trigger you talking about 25 Delta puts and vol and realized stuff. So, you know, we went there and it's always a pleasure <laughs> to discuss these Likewise. corners of the market with you. Look, the other thing which is on my radar here, geographically speaking, I like macro uh, really overall is uh, two things. One is Japan, uh, which is quite an interesting case right now. So because of my previous job at a large bank, I could speak to these Japanese real money investors and they are really important in the overall uh, capital flow landscape of markets. So Japan is the largest exporter of capital in the world, literally. Um, they had accumulated a large amount of savings over the last 20 years and they basically have no good investment opportunity domestically. So they try to export their capital as much as they can. And they're large investors um, in US treasuries, in European government bonds, but also in equities, also in Australia. I mean, they are international investors to a large extent. Why am I saying this is because during periods of slower economic growth, normally speaking, they are um, very process-driven, risk-averse investors, in my experience. So they basically smell trouble and they tend to de-risk. With Europe and with their European flows, it is extremely funny that any time there was any smell of a political risk anywhere, so let's say an election in France, and is it Macron or Le Pen, or uh, is there some referendum in Italy, they just flee the market. There is no flow anymore for a couple of months until they have the certainty that things have calmed down. Even if they lose a bunch of 20, 30, 50 basis point in credit spreads, they'll stay out just to make sure their process is respected. So in periods of uncertainty, they tend to stay away effectively. And this historically has benefited the yen. Why? Pretty simple. They unwind a normal trade where they would sell yen, buy dollars or euros to go and buy out these government bonds or equities or whatever they buy. Now they do the reverse, right? They stop the flow. So on the margin, they actually even sell euros and dollars and buy back yen or anyway, they stop the counter flow that leads to um, the Japanese yen strengthening. That's in normal periods of uncertainty. This time, you're coupling this with, for the first time in 30 years, wage growth in Japan at 4%. Services inflation at 4% annualized. So you're looking at some inflationary pressures in Japan. Can we conclude definitely that this is a new inflationary wave in Japan? Not yet, but the situation has definitely changed, or at least it poses questions, and it does pose questions to a new governor of the Bank of Japan, which is also an important change, right? We have somebody else at the helm. And we're now debating whether ill curve control is the right way to go in Japan or not. So any marginal change away from that monetary policy will lead to higher domestic interest rates, higher risk-free rates, 
So basically an alternative for Japanese investors that would make repatriating cash back into Japan even more attractive because of domestically higher interest rates. I'm saying all of this because the Japanese yen is something to look at. And what Japanese investors do overall is definitely something to look at because it also impacts global equities, global fixed income. It is definitely something to look at. And we have a Bank of Japan meeting uh, on Friday this week. I'm not sure when the podcast goes out. On the 28th of April, we have a Bank of Japan meeting. I like the Japanese yen. I think there is an asymmetry in the trade. Um, if you expect the global economy to slow down anyway, like I do, generally speaking, interest rate differentials tend to close and the Japanese yen tends to benefit from it. This time you also have an idiosyncratic tailwind, potentially behind due to um, domestic inflationary pressures and changing monetary policy. Do you see a tail risk coming out of that? What is your view uh, in the next, call it uh, six to nine months, um, given that effect? Yeah, well, from a communication perspective, nobody knows this new guy, Weda. I mean, this will be the first chance this week he has. My take would have been that he has only one chance to make a first impression, which is when he shows up for the first time in front of global investors and tells us what's up in Japan. I mean, we have services inflation at 4%. What are we going to do about it? Kuroda, his predecessor, had a history in surprising investors. He did it multiple times, and I remember that very vividly. Sometimes also got burned by Mr. Kuroda myself. I'm not sure whether Weda will be the same, Jim. I don't know. But I, I can see uh, why somebody might want to own upside in the yen, which, to be honest, is not cheap anymore. I mean, the skew is there. People are aware that there is this risk. But I can see the role that the yen could play also in a diversified portfolio over the next six months. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing to look at. And the other one, the exact opposite of that, is carry trades. Because, look, again, I have traded basically one of the lowest uh, average volatility periods between 2013 and 2021 for a bank, right? And I remember at some point in 2017, it got depressing. Like, you know, you would look at, does this trade carry and roll down three basis point a quarter? Yes, I need that, please, because there is no vol. So I'd rather take those three basis point, lever it up and hope that nothing happens in the meantime. It got that bad, really. But we are now hearing again about carry, or at least I am hearing a lot about carry again uh, in the form of Brazilian real, Mexican peso, Polish zloty, Hungarian foreign of recent, anything that has embedded carry into it, a good roll down and possibly not devastating volatility. Now, Latin America has been great for that in 2022 and early 2023 because also realized vol has been pretty low. So people have gotten this carry in Brazil and in Mexico, double digit yearly carry. I mean, serious good stuff there. And, you know, they've benefited from it. But to the point where I think today it might getting a bit extreme. I mean, it might get a bit rooted in the investor mindset that you can get exposure to EMs. You can get the carry. Nothing happens. There is nothing to be worried about. You know, Poland or Hungary or Brazil become safe havens, good carry trades. And I think there is something to consider there because Japan has no carry, obviously. And... People are hesitant whether to have it in the portfolio where they're very happy to keep adding positions that generate carry. Again, it's a matter of positioning and investors shifting a bit their stance. And I would be very, very careful about that at this stage of the cycle. That's, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I a year ago, you know, started talking about some of these things. Uh, the problem is it always takes a bit longer than you expect. I mean, you look at 90 six to 99, right? Uh, all the emerging market crises we saw, all of the, you know, the Russian ruble, the Asian flu, everything that came out of the interest rate hiking cycle then. Um, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of other examples other than that, right? But that's a, a classic uh, example that I lived through. And you can't help but wonder, you know, when is that again, that Minsky moment, when does, when do things break? Because we are having uh, a lot of those pressures building and building and building, uh, you know, questions, when will it, when will it happen? I, I, I agree. It's something very important to watch on April 28th. 
Now, guys, I hate to interrupt this conversation because <laughs> oh, I'm Neil, just, you're still I'm here. Just, I'm, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still here, and uh, I'm enjoying it immensely, as I'm sure all our listeners are. Um, but I do want to throw a couple of things at both of you, really, just to shift gear a little bit. Uh, I know we've talked about both sides of the coin, so to speak, and I can see, um, I, I can see, uh, I wouldn't say a case for both, but I can see some of your scenarios play out uh in in an odd way but one of the things that i'm i'm sitting left with is is this thing that yeah we are comparing a lot of these things that might happen in the future to things that's happened in the past i'm of the belief that maybe things won't actually happen exactly as it's happened in the past and i couldn't help noticing ray dalio's latest uh, piece on linkedin a couple of days ago where he talks about these five forces that he's written about for a long time so the big debt cycle conflicts within countries conflicts between countries um, then he also talks about acts of nature which of course we don't control and then technology and and I since I think what he's saying is that he sees that all of these forces of course some of them are a little bit unpredictable but he sees all of these forces coming to to a pass right now like they did last time in the 30s to the to 1945 and so um I don't necessarily need you to comment on this but this is just something where I'm thinking that maybe we will end up being surprised. Maybe Alf is right that the Fed will be forced to take rates to zero, but maybe the bonds will actually take that as a negative and 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 bond yields will go to 10. I mean, who knows? And maybe inflation will be a lot stickier than what it might do or what it should do compared to the fact that we're slowing down the economy and so on and so forth. I think there's room for many uh, surprises. But where I do want to go to just to change things a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the US dollar because suddenly, I mean, this de-dollarization has really come to, um, you know, to to the forefront. Um, and I couldn't help uh, noticing, I think yesterday in the Financial Times, that Stanley Druckenmiller, and I think when he speaks, I'm definitely paying attention, saying that that is his high conviction trade right now, the only one, and that is short dollar um, and he bases that on the fact that he sees uh, problems with the U.S. policymaking. Um, he also believes, by the way, that currency trends, uh, maybe like you do, Alf, as well, um, will last usually for two to three years. I mean, he does sound a little bit like a trend follower, if, I, if I'm going to be honest here. But at the same time, I'm also thinking, yeah, okay, um, but there are other dirty shirts in, in the laundry basket. That doesn't necessarily mean that the dollar is going to take the full brunt and then I'm going to throw something further at you uh, just to pack it all in. Um, the change on the global stage. I mean, Jim and I obviously have talked to a lot of people about geopolitics. And suddenly in the last few months, uh, even today, we're seeing things happening where China is kind of taking center stage. Saudi Arabia is taking center stage. They're the ones making the peace deals. Now I just see on Bloomberg right now or on the internet on Bloomberg – that she speaks to Zelensky for the first time during the war. I mean, things are happening. There's stuff going on that definitely is, is changing b b below the surface. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your your thoughts about this. And maybe we can throw in oil. We can throw in gold. Central banks buying gold. We can throw in the whole thing in the last 10, 15 minutes we have together today. Um, but I'd just love to hear how all of these things um, play into your playbook so to speak we have done it all i think from equities to vol to fixed income now we missed the dollar and commodities and geopolitics i think so let's do that why not so the dollar um okay so stanley druckenmiller is telling us that he's in the hard landing camp but is short the dollar interesting very interesting i think because look i've had i've had a look at what happens to the dollar in periods where tight monetary and fiscal policy led to a recession or very slow growth. And there is no immediate conclusion to what happens. It really depends from the form of recession you get. What do I mean there? If you get a recession without deleveraging, without credit stress, without massive deleveraging episodes, then it's not a given that the dollar appreciates. If you get 
a recession with a credit deleveraging event, it always ends up appreciating. So let me explain how, for a second, how the system really works. It's pretty simple. So we have built a system that is based on debt and credit domestically in the US, but also a system that is based on debt and credit denominated in dollars issued by entities that have no organic access to the dollar. So a Brazilian corporate that sells soybeans in dollars will need to lever up their balance sheet and they will issue debt in dollars. Now, how do they pay coupons? How do they service that in dollars? Is by selling soybeans in dollars, so by global trades. And they have no organic access to the dollars apart from this trade growth. If trade growth comes down, then obviously they have to deleverage to make sure that they can get their hands on the dollars and pay back their liabilities. So what that happens is the denominator of all the system appreciates. When you deleverage a system, it's the denominator of the system, the dollar itself, that actually gets a bid. You're basically compressing the system on itself, and so the dollar benefits. Any deleveraging event leads to a mechanical appreciation of the dollar. It's just how the system is built. But if you get a recession, even a hard landing, let's call it like that, without a major credit deleveraging event, well, then it's other things that drive the dollar. Is it, for instance, Fed policy, right? So if the Fed slashes rates to 0% and other central banks around the world are maybe not in the same camp yet, then you get the euro going to 130 and 140 against the dollar. We have seen it already. We have seen it partially happening before the great financial crisis. We have seen it happening in 2011 and 2012. It tends to happen. So it's not that clear cut, I think, what happens to the dollar during a recession. It depends from which shape a recession takes. Jem, what do you say? Yeah, so um, I agree it's not clear. What is clear to me and what I like to think about um, on these things is distribution, right? And what's clear to me, is, and again, is true historically as well, is that volatility during periods of uh, inflation in the dollar, in uh, current FX in general, trends significantly higher. And there is more vol to the vol as well. So the kind of the, the the next derivative of vol is also even more leptocurtic. So the trade, in my opinion, is not to take a direction on it, but is actually to buy vol in that space. It is already increased significantly, as you've noted, and but historically it's still not expensive. And particularly the vol of vol, the most convex moment of the distribution is cheap. There are contrary, I agree with Drunken Miller on a, his 10 year stagnation thesis for a lot of the same reasons. My view, however, is, you know, I'll tell you a little quick story. I just went into, uh, in for a, a global, a TST pre-check, uh, kind of the, the global entry interview yesterday. The woman interviewed me, uh, was supposed to be interviewing me on my qualifications of whether or not to get this. Uh, instead it became a conversation about the weakness of the U.S. dollar and how it would, how she believed the dollar was in secular decline. Customs agent, I'm hearing this everywhere. Usually, if I'm hearing it from my customs agent, uh, that that's reason for to take the other side of the trade. Um, have at that anecdotally what you will, but the reality is, I do think there's a lot of that out there. I think uh, the death of the U.S. dollar is much much exaggerated. I believe you were hearing a lot of that right before it ran to you know local highs right last year um, into the last decline in markets and deleveraging. So if we're talking about a coming potential decline in markets, not just the mechanical effects that, that Alf talks about, but I do think the positioning is actually uh, not in your favor either. Um, yes, there is a lot of movements in India and movements in Saudi Arabia and movements away from the dollar. And there's a lot of agita and fear and not to mention schadenfreude, right? There's a lot of people outside the U.S. would love to see the strength of the U.S. dollar fit. But the structural realities are, again, this is not a egocentric American view. I want to be clear. The, the structural realities are, this is the strongest, biggest economy in the world, maybe not the strongest, biggest military in the world. And the rule of law here is decentralized much more than any other autocratic. And that's probably the most important place. And there's a belief, at least, right or wrong, that your money is safer here than in China and that in, you know, Europe or other places. 
And there's a reason for those beliefs. We'll see if they continue. Um, that doesn't mean we can't get volatility along the way. Um, you know, broadly, I would believe we are in a structurally inflationary place where if you do have, if you continue to have the exorbitant privilege of the U.S. dollar, it's a big if, but I think the odds are in the favor that that does not, is not going to change overnight. And if you have the exorbitant privilege of the U.S. dollar, you have the ability to export inflation, right? The Fed has control and ultimately, uh, you know, it is in the Fed's best interest to have a strong dollar during periods of inflation. So I would be betting in that direction. The exorbitant privilege of the dollar is one side of the coin. And I'm going to make now the argument that is also very hard as a task to be the dollar, to have that role, to fulfill it really. Because what you need, you are the denominator of most global trades, most global invoices, most FX transactions in the world, which means Saudi Arabia sells oil denominated in dollar, gets back what? Dollars. So the first question you need to be able to assess and to answer is, can you provide an outlet where I can recycle these dollars in a liquid, deep, repo-backed market that you continue to supply with and increase in size over time? Because global trade grows, the economy grows. Saudi Arabia sells more oil, they get more dollars. So can you give me an a big, liquid, deep, and ever-increasing market where to allocate back these dollars. It's not easy. Europe can't provide you with that because we don't have a very large AAA market in Europe. I mean, we have a very small AAA market in Europe, like safe, bond market is really small compared to the size of Europe. Japan can't provide you with that. Man, I mean, the central bank has bought 60% of the market. This market doesn't trade for days in a row. So I'm sorry, but it doesn't fulfill the criteria of liquid, deep, repo-backed market. Where else do you want to go and look at? China, Russia? I mean, you're lucky if they don't lock up your money. And the rule of law is not necessarily very strong over there. So it is an exorbitant privilege, Jem, and you're right. But it is also difficult to fulfill the role to be the dollar, right? And on top of it, the other side of the equation, that. $12 trillion of dollar-denominated liabilities sitting outside the United States. I mean, entities, corporates that have levered up in dollars. So transitioning away from such a levered system where leverage sits outside the United States is not an orderly process. It's a very messy one. And so when people tell me, you know, we're going to de-dollarize, my first question is, well, Good luck with that. It's going to be very hard and very, very chaotic as well. And in the past, every attempt at moving the global reserve currency either into another one or changing the system, maybe a gold-based system, for example, it's been very painful. It's nothing to be, you know, super excited about, to say the least, if it ever happens. And then the alternatives, both on the asset side and on the liability side, because I said there are $12 trillion of debt, can you imagine issuing debt in Remimbi? Can you imagine issuing that in Russian ruble? It's where is the alternative really? And there is, you know, it's really hard to say. All right, let's just uh, tackle the last two then. Um, commodities. What are your What are your thoughts on on what's going on there? I will say the following: We had a forty year period where the Fed had ultimate control, right? Uh, they their uh, dual mandate of Mono, uh, price stability and maximum employment were aligned because they had secular deflation. They could come in and stimulate. And the Fed put was therefore dominant. We had a two-dimensional system where only cyclicality really mattered. We reached our natural state of inequality, right? There are other effects that, that are now driving things the other way. And the Fed is now in a box where they have dual, a dual mandate, which are in conflict, right? Which opens up much more dimensionality. This similar to other inflationary periods, creates a situation of, again, more dimensionality and more global conflict, right? There's, a, there's an ability for other entities to push back, and, and there's a reason to, given some of the populism and things. That are happening. So these things are connected. When that happens, you begin to see other sources of strength, think OPEC, right? Other places where people are flexing their muscles, to get the benefit of the strength that they have. Much like the Fed has used the exorbitant privilege of the US dollar to its benefit, other entities begin to use their strengths to their benefits. 
there is a group of countries that have one major benefit, which is they have the lion's share of commodities. And in the 60s and 70s, again, people think of these as unconnected events. When you think about inflation in the 60s and 70s, you go on Google it online, people will be like, fiscal spending uh, aligned weirdly with all of this uh, OPEC crisis and global conflict. And my view is they're all very much connected. And so I think we're entering a period of more, less of a Fed put. The Fed is going to be less likely to be able to control. So this is part of why I disagree with your zero, uh, the Fed going to 0% again, because I don't think they'll be able to. But they, I also believe what that means is OPEC and other entities that have control over commodities and broad resources, whatever those resources may be, will flex their mu muscles and put puts on those things. And I've been talking about this, Niels and I have been talking about this for some time. I talked about last quarter again before OPEC stepped back in and put a put back on the market again. So I think you can expect to see that in the next decade, not just the next year or two. Um, and that should underpin, much like the Fed underpin equity values and increase multiples, that should underpin commodity prices and tr reduce industrial commodity volatility. Ironically, the volatility that increases that I've been talking about, which are dollar FX, uh, gold, which has been mispriced, I think, until more recently, and we talked about that. All of those things should increase, but ironically, long-term volatility in equities and co industrial commodities and other uh, products where there is an ability to flex uh, muscles and right puts uh, by bigger, stronger entities will decrease. So that's my broad view on industrial commodities and, and where we're going in the, in the near future. The volatility of inflation will be higher over the next 10 years. Not only the trend the long-term average might move higher, but the volatility around this trend will be higher, which means commodities have a, an important role in a macro portfolio because in periods of high inflation and not necessarily super strong growth, it is hard to find diversifiers. And Niels can provide you with some CTA trend-following diversifiers. In those periods, they work very well. For more traditional, let's say, asset classes, commodities, industrial commodities tend to perform pretty well when inflation ball is pretty high, especially on the way up, obviously, where inflation is increasing rapidly, where the momentum is increasing rapidly. So I think they deserve a role in macro portfolios that is much more important than, the, than it was over the last 10 to 20 years, where people had just forgotten about the asset class. It didn't do much. It didn't provide you with any major diversification, or I should say, there was no major inflation momentum on the upside. And that's why they actually fell out of fashion. I think they deserve a better role and a larger role in macro portfolios going forward. Agreed. Uh, we're, we're only agreeing on things for the back you half see, of the show. You see, Jim, I told you, we actually, I think we agree more than you think. No, for sure. I, I, I just I had to make it interesting at the beginning. We had to talk about what we don't agree. Sure. About this, first. this is how we bring people together on this little <laughs> podcast. We start from opposite sides and we get closer and closer. And before we get to the final question and point I wanted to discuss, which is geopolitics, uh, I will just add to what you kindly said, Alfonso, that Yes, not only do CTAs uh, have, um, you know, some added value when it, when commodities are in a, uh, you could say, high volatile environment, but actually also in a year like last year, where commodities sold off pretty strongly um, against most uh, people's expectation following the Ukraine invasion, you know, they also did pretty well. So, um, yeah. Now, geopolitics, last point, I think it's such an important part it kind of ties into everything we've spoken about today there are things that are changing it's changing rapidly uh in uh, as far as i can tell and so i'd just love to hear your your thoughts on on what's going on when we um, not necessarily look at markets but look at countries and policies and people um and maybe alf i could start with you just to sort of get your perspective on on whether whether where the world is is heading mm. Well, I think it's undeniable that the bipolarity is getting stronger, that you are that you have Lagarde coming out and making a speech talking about how important it is to keep basically the Western powers aligned. And then you have on the other end, Lula showing up at a basically BRICS kind of conference calling for uh, 
you know, asking these questions very loudly. Why do we need to have the dollar? Why do we need to, to, to be tied to the dollar? Can't a BRICS central bank issue a currency where, you know, we use that as a denominator to trade against each other? So, yeah, the world is becoming more bipolar, I think. <laughs> Nobody can deny that. When it comes to investments, not to be too philosophical and to be more practical, I think this speaks to the power of a true global macro mind. And there are two things to consider. When I say global macro, people generally think U.S. equities, U.S. rates, credits, maybe European equities, credits, and you know commodities effects, and that's it. The reality is there is a lot more. So when the Chinese reopening was actually a one can almost call it a geopolitical event, right? The decision to reopen the second largest economy in the world. The trades that were available, the best ones were in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Myanmar. Those are places that obviously, if you don't care about politics and geopolitics at the global levels, you're not going to look at. But sometimes you can widen your horizons and take a broader perspective and actually be able to generate some interesting returns in those places. So I think investors need to become more acquainted with looking at the world. And the world isn't the US and Europe only. It's everything else. Yeah, I'll, draw, I'll jump in with one last point. Um, you know, how do we know or why do we think that this trend will continue? Um, I agree with Alf. It's a simple fact that populism, which is demographically tied to this younger generation, is by definition local. People live in countries and they care about their families and the people they live with. Fiscal policy drives populism, nationalism. Monetary policy drives money to corporations and capital. And capital is international and tends to be correlated with globalization. So we are approaching a period, if we are going to continue to see populist trends, which are, again, alive and strong in every country I visited in the last year, um, it's, uh, and, and every millennial on down that I talk to, it's, it's more fervent than ever. So as long as that remains the trend, uh, expect global conflict in all its forms which is not just war, it's economic conflict, it's resource conflict, it is real politic in every form. And so if that's where we live and that's where we are, there is a particularly on the turn, which is where we are. We're on a macro turn from monetary to fiscal. We're on a macro turn from, from capitalism to populism. If you believe that not only are there immense opportunities but there are asymmetric opportunities available at this juncture, and they're likely to be not one-year, two-year opportunities, but decade-plus-long opportunities. Very good. Well, gentlemen, this was um, this was uh, illuminating. It was unpredictable at times. It was fun all the time and very enjoyable. Thanks so much, both of you, really, for uh, an awesome conversation with a lot of knowledge uh, being shared between you. I want to encourage everyone to go and follow both Jim and Alfonso. They have, uh, well, you have Substack, of course, Alf, and uh, both of you have very engaging Twitter feeds. You're incredibly generous, both of you, in terms of what you share and, and, and explain. Um, so as people can probably tell from today's conversation, we do live in a very global macro-driven world now, and it is truly important to stay uh, well-informed, and those two gentlemen that you just heard, they are the ones to follow here. From Jim and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you as we continue our Global Macro Series. And in the meantime, as usual, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.